privilege to be with you guys. Uh, I'm excited to talk with you about a subject that is near and dear to my heart, namely because it was one of my primary struggles growing up. I hated the fact that I was uh, lazy bones. I didn't live up to all the potential I had, and so this is a, a subject that I'm intensely passionate about. Um, I don't like cats because you're lazy, so there you go. <laughs> Point number one, don't get a cat. Point number two, if you don't, if you have a cat, get rid of it. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. Well, as you can see on my keynote here. <laughs> oh, no, never mind. So one of the things I saw recently that really spurred me and, and started, started me wondering here is why so many people, and by so many people, I mean those who are uh, privileged enough to have, to have the wealth and the means to do this, is to have luxury vehicles. Uh, you know, you have sports cars or exotic cars or even, you know, classic cars. And I came to find out, thank you, I came to find out that they, they sell for a, a lot of money, as you, as you would expect. What I didn't understand, though, is why for many of them, they actually don't drive them. They retain their value if they're not driven as much or as long. So if you have lesser miles on it, it's, it's worth more money. So I saw on a TV show not too long ago, a guy who sold some kind of Lamborghini of sorts, a classic one, had 12 miles on it. It was from the 70s. And I thought, what a waste, you know, to have this fantastically cool car and to drive it maybe once or twice in your life. And for him, the value was not in actual driving it, it was the having it. Well, hey, to each his own. If you have the wealth and the means to do that and you feel like that's a good thing for you, well, fantastic. But I thought it felt like a waste. If I had a classic car, I would drive the snot out of it. If I had a, a, pre, you know, a performance car, I'd want to see the, uh, the, the limits of its ability. In fact, I found an article that talked a little bit about this, about why don't exotic car collectors drive their cars. And they gave a couple reasons, but one of the things that I found to be especially helpful or even uh, just thoughtful for us, uh, they quote here, while toys will be fine if they're on shelves, cars shouldn't, be, shouldn't just sit in their place. Engines were built to run. They have fluids in them that can expire, parts that want to expand with heat. In short, letting a car sit uh, is, can, not the best grammar there, uh, actually damage the vehicle. And I thought that's interesting because it really parallels much of how God designed us. When we're not being utilized, our engines were designed to work. And when we're not being utilized, it actually hurts us. But it doesn't only hurt us, it hurts everybody else around us. My argument and my contention this morning is that God designed you, made you, made you for hard work. And you were designed by God to find fulfillment in that hard work. You were designed to work hard and made to find fulfillment in hard work. This is essential. It is essential to your manhood and even to your identity as a human being made in the image of God. So what I want to show you here is just from one verse. I want to show you from one passage what this looks like for us. And unlike some, some people that have a lot of money, I found out later actually in the same article, uh, for these car collectors... Uh, they most likely have a higher team of mechanics to keep the cars frozen in time. So even though it's true that they're not driving them, they're still drivable at any moment because the mechanics are keeping the fluids leveled and all the other things that go into keeping a car running well. Well, sadly, and maybe not so sadly, we don't have that opportunity. We don't have that privilege. We can't hire someone to work out for us. We can't hire someone to husband our wives. We can't hire someone to do our jobs well for us. It is incumbent upon each and every single one of us to take the bull by the horns, as it were, to defy laziness and instead to work diligently as unto the Lord and not to man. The, privilege for the privileges of this, the benefits of this are legion, legion. Now, here's what I'm not assuming here. As you open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, I'm not assuming that I'm talking to a room of lazy men. The very fact that you're up at Saturday early to be here feels like a, a little bit like I'm preaching to the choir. So I don't assume that you're a lazy bones who can't get out of bed. But what I do assume is that you, probably like me, still struggle with elements of laziness in your life. You may not be able to uh, say, man, I don't get up for my job. I'm not there on time. I think all of you guys probably do pretty well in what you do. But there are elements in our lives that we need to examine and say, is there, am I being lazy here, here, here? Is there aspects of my life that I'm kind of taking my hands off the wheel and letting it coast? And I want to show you from Scripture, from just one verse today, how God designed you to, he, he designed you for hard work. He designed you for this. This is part of your identity. And when you do this, it is meant to be fulfilling, satisfying, and it's something that's meant to flourish in your life and consequently be a contribution to the flourishing of the lives of others. God designed you. God made you 
to work hard and find fulfillment in hard work. Turn to me, Genesis chapter 2, 15, one verse. Let me show you how God describes mankind. One verse here goes, Genesis 2, 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. I want to show you this verse broken down in three different ways, but let me just first highlight a couple things for you. I don't want to belabor this, but let me just show you. Who, who, who are the people involved in this, this little verse that we're looking at? First, you've got the Lord God, uh, capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh, the God, God's covenant name with Israel. God referring to his status as, or his title. So you have his name and his title. The Lord God took the man. This is Adam we know. He's named later in the text, but it's God taking Adam. This is the template of all creation. What did he do? Well, he placed him. He put him. God set him somewhere in particular. This wasn't an accident. This is an act of God taking the man to do something with him. And then he put him where? In the Garden of Eden. This will be an important point for later, but notice the Garden of Eden was the pinnacle of perfection. It was the fruit of all that God had designed after speaking everything into existence. He made a place just for man, and he puts Adam in the garden in perfection. In this garden, however, there wasn't a lazy boy. In fact, God makes it clear he puts him there for a specific purpose. God puts Adam in the Garden of Eden in perfection to do two things, to work and keep, to work the garden and to protect the garden. And this is all in Genesis 2.15. And as I already stated here, this gives us a sense of how God templated us to function as men. Now, of course, being made in the image of God, this applies not only to men, but also to women. But in particular, as the, as the image bearers that God designed to be the head, he made you for a specific purpose. Now, here's how this connects to laziness. If we allow laziness a foothold in our lives, even in a little place, this has the power to undermine the very thing that God made you for. I put it like this in point number one, you should not let laziness steal your purpose. Don't let laziness creep into your life and rob you of your very explicit purpose for which God made you, which is namely to work. God designed you for work. It's expressly purposed in his creation of all mankind. And this is before the fall. This is before the fall of all things. This is before sin entered the world. In high school, I had this beach cruiser. It was a red beach cruiser that I borrowed from a friend. And I used it all the time because I didn't have a car. So I drove it, or rode it, rather, to and from school, to and from work. One night, coming home late from a long day, after I was working at McDonald's at the time, I rode the bike home, and at my house, there was a, you know, a chain-link fence. It was probably about six, six and a half foot high, perhaps. So it was high enough to be somewhat of a deterrent. Um, I, I pulled my bike into the gate, and I parked it behind the chain-link fence. So tired, didn't bother to think much else about it closed the gates, which I locked, and then went to bed. It was like 2 a.m., late night. I woke up in the morning to get ready to go to the next thing. I walk out to the driveway, and what do you see? It wasn't my bike. My driveway was empty. And my bike was gone. It dawned on me that when I pulled my bike in, and even though I did lock the chain link fence, the chain link fence was only my height. Someone could easily have gotten over the fence, taken my bike, and, and ran, uh, I guess not ran with it, they would have rode it away. I thought to myself, okay, so this is my friend's bike at the time. I thought, what an idiot I was. I can't believe it. I essentially let this happen. I invited it because I didn't take any precaution to protect this investment that my friend made in me. We can just as easily do that with laziness. Laziness does threaten you. It doesn't threaten your bike. It threatens your purpose for existence. And when we allow laziness to do that, it undermines the, the very function that God gave to us. Hard work. He made us for hard work and to find fulfillment in working hard. Let me show you this. God gave us a, a mission to fulfill in Genesis 1.28. Take a look with me really quickly. In Genesis 1.28, this is just a, you know, a, page be, a page behind. God, when he made man, this is his vision statement of sorts. He says this, let us make man, this is verse 26, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion to have rulership over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God's design for man was to exercise leadership from the very beginning. 
And notice here that that leadership is consistent. It comes from the source of God himself. Let us make man in our image. Your working, your leadership, your rulership over creation and the things that God has entrusted to you is from the source of God. You're made to work because God himself is a worker. In fact, let me argue this, you were designed by God for a purpose. Genesis 1.28 shows us that. That purpose, uh, let us make man in our image. This is God telling, uh, declaring what he's going to do with man. And what are they supposed to do? Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, and over all the earth and every creeping thing. And then God blessed them and says in verse 28, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish and over the birds and the heavens and over every creeping thing. Man was designed for a purpose. Now let me talk to you really quick. So this is, there's, there's the verse that I just showed you here. You're designed for a purpose. Now if you're not a Christian, let me just quickly say this. God designed you with a very clear reason in mind. And one of those reasons is to be workers, but that's not all he designed you for. One of the reasons God designed us is to be in right relationship with him. You could be the best worker that your company or your family has ever seen, but if you're not right with him, you're missing the point because God designed you to be in right relationship with him. The primary purpose that God designed you for is clear in his scriptures. His primary reason for your existence is greater than what you might even realize. You were made in the image of God. And as I argue here, you're being made in his image means you reflect some of God's character. God himself is a worker. But even more than that, you were designed by God to bring him glory through your work. To have a life that is poured out for the good of all mankind. Laziness robs this from you. Laziness steals this purpose from your life. Even when you allow just a little bit, it's like having a few weeds in your garden. Your garden will suffer because of those weeds. The weed of laziness grows in every crevice of our lives if we allow it to. And primarily, it steals from you the very reason that you were designed. Now, I don't watch a lot of kid movies um, by choice, <laughs> but I have kids. So one of the movies I actually really enjoyed was Toy Story. I think it made a profound point. Toys were designed, they were made for the express purpose of being enjoyed by a child. And so the whole movie's premise is about these toys that are trying to find their satisfaction, embracing their ontology, embracing their toyness to make this kid happy. This toy comes along, Buzz Lightyear, he's a spaceship guy, and he defies this, this concept. I'm not a toy, I'm a, you know, I'm a cadet of the space commanding force or whatever. Realization uh, the, the realization of the movie is that the cowboy helps the spaceman to realize you're a toy and you're made for the pleasure of a boy. When that finally dawns on him, he embraces his identity, his purpose. Suddenly, his life is better. He's living consistent with the purpose that the toy maker made for him. Same thing is true for us. When we live consistent with the purpose that the maker made us for, suddenly life clicks into place. You were designed by God for the purpose, and the purpose of that, the purpose that he designed, is to bring him glory through your work, through your labor, through your response to his design for your life. I like that how the Westminster Shorter Catechism summarizes this for us. What is the chief end of man? What is the grandest purpose that you were made for? Whether you're a plumber, a physician, or something else in between, a priest, or I guess a pastor would be a better one, What's the chief end of man? Not to, to bring glory to God, to glorify him, to enjoy him forever. How do we bring glory to God? Well, again, I argue we do that by exercising works that are done by faith in him. Practically then, what that looks like, now I, I know for, for many of you, the first thing that might come to mind when we talk about laziness, you think about, okay, my work, my occupation, my calling. And that one is probably one of the most obvious, but let's go through a few of the domains of stewardship that God has given you to take dominion over. First of all, and most obviously, your relationship with God. This is the area that you should give plenty of attention to, but let's also consider our marriages, let's consider our career and calling, that does matter. Let's consider our finances, our parenting, our physical health. How about our friendships, and what about our rest and recreation? These are a few, or just a kind of a, a collection of different domains of stewardship that God has given you. These are not areas that are meant to be uh, relaxed. These are gardens that are to be tended to. And my encouragement to you is that in all of these, first and foremost, what's going to be 
obvious is your career and calling, but what really is the foundation of everything is your relationship with God. So to, to not beat the drum too hard, but to repeat the theme and to impress upon you, your relationship with God is the fountain from which everything else in your life flows. If this part of your life is polluted, everything else will, of necessity, suffer because you're not living in alignment with what's most true about you. You are a creature made for the creator. And when you defy that, everything else will, of necessity, suffer. Genesis 2.15, you're made by the Lord God. And when you live your life in a submission to him, everything else will fit appropriately and properly. In fact, I was uh, listening to this entrepreneur talk about, uh, I don't know, was being obsessed with being successful. And he was talking about, you know, making money and hustling and, you know, all these other things about being an entrepreneur. And I found it to be encouraging and inspiring in some ways. But I kept on taking issue with the word that he chose to define what it meant to accomplish something. You talk about success, success, success. And it occurred to me, okay, how is he def defining success? Because it's going to be fundamentally different from how a Christian would define success. Every venture seeks to make money, right? You're not trying to just throw money out the window, and certainly that's important. But for the Christian, success is not just making money. Success is living faithfully before God. That's what it be, would be for us. To, to have true success at the end of your life is not to amass a fortune or to even have a, a great family, although those things are nice. You want to live faithfully before the Lord. Laziness is not faithful. Laziness defies God's intentions for our lives. I like the way that John Wesley puts it. Our job in this life to live faithfully before the Lord is to do all the good you can by all the means you can in all the ways you can in all the places you can at all times that you can to all the people you can as long as you ever can. I love that because it, it, it creates a picture for us of what it means to be faithful before the Lord. You can't do everything. You can't do everything. I understand that but you can give as much as you're capable of giving. You have a, a ceiling that you probably haven't hit yet. And I think as long as you continue to be given life by God, our responsibility is to see where that limit is, to push ourselves in defiance of the temptation to be lazy, to kick our feet up, and to allow ourselves to take a back seat. Lord God took the man, the Lord God, it was the one, he was the one who was initiating all this. He took him and put him in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden, of course, is the place that God made to be a perfect atmosphere, a perfect context for which human beings could flourish. It was made to be uh, beautiful, and uh, it was made to even be tilled by, by Adam himself. One of the things that might come to your mind here is that this, this place of perfection was sullied. It was ruined by the introduction of sin in Genesis chapter 3. Except that's not entirely true. While it is true that work is plagued with curse, the curse, that doesn't change the fact that work is still something that was meant to be a gift. Again, remember, this is perfection. This is before sin entered. And yet God gives it to Adam and says, my gift to you, Adam, is to work this place and to keep it. The Garden of Eden was a gift. It was a gift in perfection. So what I want to encourage you with, as you think about your call, your purpose that God gave you, is not only to consider the fact that you're designed by God for a purpose, to work hard, but also that your attitude about work should be maintained as something that you could say, look, this is a good thing. I, I get to work. Not I have to, and there is a have to there too, but you get to. You have uh, all these gifts that God has given you to exercise hard work for his glory and honor. Point number two, don't let laziness sour your attitude, which tends to be the issue, isn't it? We tend to think uh, about work and you know, the commitments and responsibilities we have as begrudging things that we just have to get out of the way. And I want to free you from that mentality because to work is a good and godly gift. Now, I bring this up to my boys all the time. I'm trying to help them learn that a godly work ethic is, is noble and good for them. Their attitude is something they can choose. I tell them, look, guys, you have to do the dishes, but you can choose to do the dishes, gritting your teeth and saying, when's this going to be over? Or you can say, how can I make these the best dishes that are the most clean that I've ever done? How can I make this something that is a gift to my family? a way that I serve our family, and even a way that I practice a noble, godly work ethic. Your attitude can make or break everything that you're doing. When you drive home after a long day's work, you can either think to yourself, man, I have to, you know, I'm going to have to do this, I have to fix this thing over here, I have to go, I have a honey-do list, 
Or you can go home and say, I get to serve my family. And praise God that I have energy, I have strength. Praise God that my eyes still work. Praise God that I have all my appendages. I have two legs, I have two arms. You know, I'm mentally able, I'm capable, I'm fit. I still have life. Praise God that I get to serve my family. Oh, it's a Thursday night. I get to serve at Awana now too. I'm going to drive to Awana. I'm going to be fully present and give the best that I have to give because God has granted me this great thing called life. Laziness will lie to you. Laziness will tell you, hey, you deserve more time off. Hey, no one appreciates you anyway. No one's going to care if you miss a night or if you just kick up your feet or if you binge watch whatever season of such, such and such on the Netflix or whatever. No one's going to care if you just play several rounds of golf. It, it, it's not going to matter. You've earned it. You deserve it. We'll talk about rest briefly at the end of the sermon because I do think that there's some, there's, there's some room for rest to, to have a place in our lives. But more often than not, laziness is the thing that's lying to us about the work that we're given to do. Laziness is trying to sully our attitude. It's important to know that hard work is a gift, a good gift from God. You shouldn't resent it. Work is tainted by sin and creation, and it's frustrating when things don't work as they should. But even so, even with the frustrations that come with sin, here's what the author of Ecclesiastes says. There's nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. And this also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or have enjoyment? Where does the ability for all this stuff come from? It comes from God. Your work, hard work in particular, defying laziness is a good gift of God that he wants you to enjoy and to utilize for the good of all people. Because good, because work is still a good gift from God, you shouldn't resent it. Instead, you should thank God for responsibilities. I would love for you to, even today, you're sitting here and you're thinking about the vast number of things that God has made you responsible over. Thank God for those things. God has entrusted to you, if you're a Christian man with a godly woman, he's entrusted to you one of his daughters. He's given her to you to steward, to, to love, to shepherd in many respects. If God has given you kids or grandkids or even spiritual kids that you've adopted, thank God for that. God has entrusted you with something worthy of your attention and time. If God has given you a home or you know, resources, thank God for those things. That means in some way God has entrusted you. He was faithful in little, is faithful in much. God has gifted them to you as a means of stewardship to take dominion over, thank God for your responsibilities. And when you're struggling to, to get off the couch because you're already in that state of, uh, of being a, a, bit, a bit lazy, thank you, God, for my responsibilities. Thank you for my lawnmower. I'm going to go mow the lawn to the glory of God. Thank you, God, for my small group that I get to serve tonight at you know, HFG or my small group gathering. Thank you, God, for the people in my life. Reframe your attitude. Don't resent the hard work that God has entrusted to you and ask God to make you faithful in each. Because they're a gift, because it's a good gift, ask God to make you faithful, competent in these domains of stewardship. Men, constantly, constantly go to that last day. You're going to face God. You're going to meet him. And he's going to have you stand before him and give an account for your life. Constantly think about that day. Because when you do, and you reframe your temporary life in light of your eternal status before God, it's going to make it a lot easier to say, okay, right now I'm not feeling it. But then and there I will. So I'm going to do the right thing right now in order to enjoy the greatest privilege before God in the there and then. Work is, hard work is a good gift to God. Don't resent it. Hard work is a good gift of God. Oof, okay. I'm, here's what the, that second point is. Hard work is still a good gift of God. Take pleasure in excellence. Take pleasure in excellence. Ecclesiastes 9.10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Work diligently at it. Give it your best. Take pleasure in excellence. And again, we're not just talking about your career, even though that's clear, a clear application. We're talking about all the domains of your life. Take pleasure in doing excellent work before the Lord. I've read so many books about uh, the productivity, the, the godly, not a godly, uh, uh, a worldly mindset about how uh, productivity is good and how you should give yourself to being a, a master craftsman. Uh, there's some really good books out there about stuff like that. But what I get frustrated about is that Christians have so much more to say about that. A, a worldling can say, hey, be a master craftsman in your field and you'll enjoy great success. 
however they define that. A Christian can say, because I belong to Jesus Christ, because he has saved me from my sin, he deserves everything I have to give, and that means I want to be amazing in all the stewardship he's given me, and I want to please him by working with excellence in all that he's given me. I don't do it for the money. I do it for the glory of God. And if money's a happy byproduct, well, then fantastic. I now have greater resources to serve the kingdom of God. Tim Challies in his book, Do More Better, says, if Christ has served us to such a great extent, who are we to withhold even the smallest act of service from one another? See, that reframes the way that we think about work or laziness. Laziness, then, is not just a poor character quality. Laziness is a rebel defying the dominion of King Jesus in your life. Vastly different way of understanding that. Work is still a good gift of God. Take pleasure in excellence. This goes back to your attitude, not letting laziness sour your attitude. Finally, point number three here, let's look at Genesis 2.15 once more. I want to highlight now the part of the verse that is most obvious that I haven't talked about yet. The Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden. He placed him there on purpose. It's the place of perfection. And he gave him a mission. He gave him a task tied into his identity, to work it and to keep it. Those two words there are slightly different things. The working part is tilling, toiling, laboring, even giving his effort to this. Now, again, this is before the introduction of sin, which means that God made the garden in such a way that even in perfection, there was work to be done. What would that work look like? I don't know. Maybe Adam you know, made neat rows of corn, or I don't, I, don't know. I don't know what he did in the garden, but there was work to be done, difficult work that God said, there you go, buddy, you're going to love this. It's like when your boys play in the mud and they're having the greatest time in the world, just kind of getting their hands dirty and just enjoying being a boy. It's like God saying, here you go, Adam. You get to enjoy being a man. Work. It's going to be amazing. You're going to love it. Remember, we work because God's a worker. We're made in his image. We're made for this. Gives him work to do. And then the second part of this, we're to work and to keep it. So working means I'm working in it. I'm doing stuff. And, and, and the keeping is I'm watching over it. I'm looking after it. I'm guarding it. I'm protecting it. It's the opposite of what I do with my beach cruiser, my friend's beach cruiser, and I guard it or protect it. Your job is to guard and protect the investment that you're making in the labor that God has given you. It's to be toilsome. It's meant to be effortful. It's meant to be difficult. It's a challenge that God has given us as men. Put it like this in point number three. Don't let laziness soften your effort. Don't let laziness soften your effort. Sometimes we can defy our laziness and we'll do the thing whatever the thing is, but we won't do it in the way that it deserves. We'll get, we'll get it done. It's sufficient. I don't need to give it much more time. Um, and there is a time for that. There is a time for that. I'm sorry. I went back. Let me go back to that slide for you. There is a time for that, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about working smarter versus harder. I'm just saying we're giving it a half attitude. Can't let laziness soften our effort. I read a, a book by a sports writer who talks about having the opportunity to interact with Kobe Bryant. And he got to join him for his training one morning. He asked Kobe if he could join him at his training. Kobe says, yes, it starts at four. Uh, and the sports writer says, great, I'm going to beat him to this. And so the sports writer shows up at 3.30 a.m., by the way, 4 a.m., 3.30, shows up at 3.30 a.m., goes into the gym, and what do you notice? Kobe's already, his sneakers are already screeching against the, the hard top. He's already shooting hoops and doing baskets. He's already sweating at 3.30 in his warm-up prior to the 4 a.m. start time. And so he goes and sits on the stands and observes Kobe drilling and practicing. At the end of the practice, he approaches Kobe to ask him a few follow-up questions. He says, for 45 minutes, I watched the best player in the world do the most basic drills. He said, I watched the best player on the planet do basic ball handling drills, basic footwork, basic offensive moves. So later, he says, I went to him. He says, I really enjoyed watching your workout this morning. Kobe replies, no problem. He says, then I hesitated, not wanting to sound rude or worse, condescending. You're the best basketball player in the world. Why do such basic stuff? He flashed that gleaming smile of his. Why do you think I'm the best player in the game, he asked because I never get bored with the basics. I love that. I love that. Now, some of the things that we're about to talk about might seem rather basic to you, 
But let me encourage you not to get bored with the basics because the basics are what are going to help us pursue that kind of effort to give our very best. Now, I constantly look at guys like this, the Kobe Bryants and the John Williams of the world and you know, the, the greatest athletes and people of our time. I look at them and I say, man, they're doing it for worldly success. And, and hey, there's nothing wrong with what they're doing necessarily. But man, let the church, let the men of the church rise up and give their best for the sake of the glory of God to excel beyond what we think is possible in order to magnify God to the greatest degree possible. Don't get bored with the basics, men. So let me encourage you. If you're going to start this, if you're going to walk away from this sermon, I want you to start taking stock and investing in the lagging domains of your stewardship. We all know that common sense is not always common practice, as the saying goes. So what I want you to do now is to begin thinking, if you haven't already, about all the domains of stewardship. Let me put them back on the screen for you. Think through these areas, your relationships, your career, parenting, friendship, etc. Think through all of those areas and say, which part of this, uh, which area in my life is lacking? What needs my fixed attention and effort in order to begin making progress in these areas? Your relationship with God. Are you daily spending time with God? Is that a fixed part of your schedule? For many men, this is still a common struggle. And, and I understand that there's a lot of things in your life that would make it really hard for you. This is not a daily part of your life. Please, today, resolve to do that. Figure out how to go about that. Your marriage. Are you loving your wife as Christ loved the church? Are you pursuing her in the way that God has intended for you as one of his daughters, as he's gifted to you? Your career. Are you working heartily as for the Lord and not for men? Are you serving your employees well? Are you serving your boss well? Are you living in a way that they would say that man is above reproach? I don't like what he talks about. I don't like his Christianity, but I I can respect his life because he's a man who lives what he teaches. How about your finances? Are you spending, saving, and giving in a way that would please the Lord? When you die and you stand before him, will he say, well done, good and faithful servant? Your parenting. Are you personally discipling your children? Or as the case may, may be, are you discipling your grandchildren if you have the opportunity? If not them, are you personally taking an active interest in discipling the young people of the church? Are you utilizing the wisdom, the resources God has given you to impact the next generation? The church will partner with you to disciple your kids, but it will not do it for you. You must do that. Your kids need you. In fact, I read a book not too long ago called The Great Evangelical Recession. I think that's the title, something like that. It talks about how the church is rapidly declining because of a multitude of factors, and among those factors are that men are not taking the role in their families that they should. The priorities are for work and success and yada, 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 and therefore the church is losing her sharp edge in discipleship. Look, I don't know if that's true in your life, but it's worth asking the question. Am I personally discipling my children? Am I leading my family? loving my bride? How about your physical health? Are you stewarding, stewarding your body in a way that God can say, well done, good and faithful servant? You don't need to be on the cover of a magazine, but again, the objective, success, is not according to the worldly definition. Success is faithfulness. I'm being faithful to the Lord with my body. Friendships. Do you have iron sharpens iron friendships? Who has rights to your life who can challenge you even on the most important and perhaps intimate aspects of your life. You need at least one man in your life who can go toe-to-toe with you and say, I heard the way that you talked to your wife. Do you feel good about that? Or who can challenge us with you know, what we're eating or what we're watching, using our discretionary time. If you, if you struggle with laziness or lying or lust or any other sin, you need men in your life who can call you to the mats and say, let's, let's hash this out. This is not okay. And here's the thing, because we're so sensitive to each other, you know, we, men are very sensitive about the matter of respect, and that's a good thing. We don't want to disrespect one another at all, which is why I'm asking you to invite people in your life and give them that free pass and say, look, I need you to be my bro. I need you to be my iron sharpens iron kind of man who can help me overcome the sin of laziness. I'm giving you a free pass to my life. <laughs> Obviously, give it to someone you trust, but you need someone like that. There's a couple people in my life that I said, look, if you see me sin, Please tell me. You're not helping me by pretending you don't see it. I know there are blind spots in my life. Please show them to me. If I seem to be going along my merry way and I'm doing things that you know uh, dishonor Christ, please tell me. It would be a gift. You need that man in your life. You need multiple men in your life, ideally. Who are those friends? 
And if you don't have them, find them. If you do have them, make sure those relationships are strong. Finally, recreation and rest. Are you honoring your creatureliness by sleeping, recreating, and leading your family into a God-honoring kind of rest? I know this is kind of a, a weird subject to throw into discipline and, and con, con, combating laziness, but it's an important factor. I don't think God made us to work 24 hours a day or 23 hours a day and sleep for an hour. God made us creatures. God demonstrated what our creatureliness is to be to look like by saying, I worked six days and I rested on the seventh. I ceased my activity to give you an example because God didn't need the rest. He did that for our benefit to show us you need to work and you also need to rest. Six out of your seven days, work hard, do great things, honor me in that way. Seventh day, take time, slow down, rest, reflect, pray, worship, give your time and attention to the Lord. Rest and recreation. These are several domains of stewardship. There might be more that you could think of. And if there are more, fantastic. Go for it. Learn those things. Think about those things and pursue them. Uh, all I'm saying is when you think about the, the effect of laziness, laziness can rob you of these things, rob your attitude, sour your attitude rather, and, and, and can cause you to uh, ignore things that you should not ignore. Invest in those lagging domains of stewardship, but finally, regularly review them. I, I, I mean, those things I look at at least on a weekly basis, honestly. Weekly, I'm looking at those things in my life saying, how am I doing in these areas? And some weeks, I'm better in one area, not so good in another, and that's okay. Um, others, I, I'm looking at them and I'm saying, okay, I'm doing well in that. Let me make sure that these other domains of stewardship are operating faithfully and effectively because I want to die giving my best to the Lord. And I know you do too. I know that you don't want to die having left something in the tank. Now, it doesn't mean you burn out at the age of 35 or 40, but it does mean your whole life, you're saying, how can I optimize my life to love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, love my neighbor as myself? How do I do that most effectively? This is what you're made for, running hard, running smart, and giving your best to the Lord. You were made by him for hard work, and you'll find great fulfillment and satisfaction in working hard. Now, I don't know if you're a jazz fan or not, but one, one album that I loved early on in my life was A Love Supreme by John Coltrane. That's what you hear in the background right now. Uh, I got into jazz way, way early, and I loved it because it was just so mysterious to me. I didn't know how the scales work. I still don't know how it works, but I do enjoy the, the flavor that it offers. So much fun. Well, I found out recently that John Coltrane actually had something of a religious experience in his life. And I don't know if he's a Christian. I don't have any idea about that. But one of his most famous albums, this one that you're listening to here, actually had some liner notes that you might find interesting. Now, he may not be a Christian, but his attitude toward his music and his creativity was exactly how a Christian should think about it. Let me show you. This is the cover side of that, on the opposite side of that, rather. And I know it's really small text, so let me just highlight the part that I want to show you. He says this, During the year 1957, I experienced, by the grace of God, a spiritual awakening, which was, which was to lead me to a richer, fuller, more productive life. At that time, in gratitude, I humbly asked to be given the means and privilege to make others happy through music. I feel this has been granted through his grace. All praise to God. This album is a humble offering to him, an attempt to say thank you, God, through our work, even as we do in our hearts and with our tongues. May he help and strengthen all men in every good endeavor. I love that at the attitude, because it's jazz, it's music, and yet that's the mindset of the Christian. I want to, and granted, he doesn't use the name of Christ, which causes me to wonder a bit, but to say, this is what I do for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of God, to honor him by my life. So whether you're a musician, a plumber, a physician, a pastor, or just a student, recognize God made you for a purpose. You were made to work hard and to find fulfillment in hard work. If you allow laziness in your life, that will steal and undermine your purpose. You will feel worse off for it when you give into it. You don't let laziness sour your attitude. Laziness will lie to you and tell you that your work is not effective, it doesn't matter, no one cares anyway, or that you really deserve more time to rest and less time to work. Laziness will also attempt to soften your effort, to get just the bare minimum done. And I'm asking you men to embrace your identity as men, as image bearers, to work valiantly and work hard in order that you might most magnify the glory of God and most effectively serve the good of all men, your families, your wives, your kids, your church, your community. Genesis 2.15, in a nutshell. Let's pray, and then I'll dismiss you guys to your small groups, I think. God, we do pray that you would help us to embrace 
who you've made us to be. We understand, Lord, that all of us are sinners of varying degrees. We struggle in a multitude of ways, but we want to be useful to you, to your church. We want to magnify your glory. And we know that that really is undermined by the sin of laziness. And so we pray, God, please help us to defeat this. As we go into our small groups, I pray that you would help us to talk honestly about the areas that we need to grow in and that we would not simply acknowledge those areas of weakness, but that we would make some significant plans in order to make progress in those same areas. Help us, Lord. We're weak. We're dependent. You've made us this way. But our weakness and dependence can be bolstered and lifted by your strength and your independence. Give us the ability to, as godly men, to embrace the mantle of our manhood, to embrace the fact that we've been made in your image to be workers, to be hard workers, to do that for your honor and glory. We love you, Lord. Give us a vision for godly manhood and masculinity. And today, Lord, people are so confused about what a man even is. Let us not forget that we're made in your image as men to be hard workers, to love our families, to love our churches, to live for the good of mankind and for your glory. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.